Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Mikhail Thorpe, and this is the Expat Money Show. Today's guest runs Pronomos Capital, the first venture fund for charter cities and network states. He coded at Google for 10 years, runs a small angel fund since 2011, has degrees in math, CS, and business, and has been a leader in the com competitive governance space for over 20 years. Please welcome to the show, Patrick Friedman. Patrick, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm very happy to have you here. You know, I've been following your work on and off for many years now. I'm a big fan of what you do. So I guess my first question is kind of how did you get started in this field in charter cities and decided that you wanted to do venture funds and these things? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it's just the normal story of somebody who like makes a product because they want to use it and it doesn't exist, right? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm a libertarian. Uh, my, my family are libertarians. And after college, I was kind of like, all right, like what, what is the nature of the society that I'm in and does it like fit my values? And I looked at the US and was like, well, no, like not really, um, you know? And uh, and so I said, okay, well, what's what's going on here? Like, let's explore this as a, as a problem, like I would in college or something. Um, like, why is it that there, you know, that this government doesn't kind of fit well? libertarianism is like a minority viewpoint. Like most people have a different idea about how politics should be. And I was like, okay, well maybe I just need to be in a different country. And I kind of like studied countries around the world and visited some of them and saw that like each of them had kind of a different package of what they were offering to me as a citizen, but none of them was really, um, you know, there are some that, that were maybe better than the U S but there was none of them where I was like, oh yeah, that's my tribe. That's my people. And that, that sucked. I was like, what, what's going on here? And so I spent some years like reading politics and economics and trying to dig into this question of like, why aren't there like great offerings for people like me? And so I came to this idea of competitive governance where I look at government as an industry where like every country is a, is a firm that's like selling its services to the citizens. Um, you know, so like you pay your taxes and you get your government services. And I saw that this, this industry has no startups. Like there's no way that a group of people can be like, hey, here's a tribe of people, you know, like there's this new cryptocurrency thing, whatever it is, who want to live in this certain way under this certain system of laws. Let's go and create a society based on that so that they can live in it. Like that just doesn't exist. And so that's been my work for about 20 years is trying to figure out, well, how can we make it so that people can start new societies, new cities, new countries, um, so that people like me who are looking for a place to live that aligns with their values can find it. I resonate with that very much. I'm a lifelong libertarian and, you know, I visited over a hundred countries now traveling in my life and have certainly looked for libertarian countries or libertarian, libertarian governments. And <laughs> it doesn't really exist. Yes. You can have more freedom uh, in certain types of countries, um, but there's no like Shangri-La, one magic place that has all of the things that fall within our belief pattern. Um, what my strategy has been over the years is to really stack different jurisdictions and get different freedoms where I can in different places. So following flag theory and perpetual travel and these types of things. But I like your approach of trying to actually go out there and tackle this and to create something and help support other organizations who are trying to reshape freedom. So first of all, I think that that's fantastic work that you do. Second of all, how has your work been going? Like the world that we're seeing Great. these days is really <laughs> finally, <not> <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah. Like it must be very interesting over the last two and a half years to see the wake up for a lot of people and the renewed interest in freedom and really what this means. Yeah. I mean, you know, for me, it's been, I, I started working on this stuff in the early two thousands. Right. So it's been like over 20 years. Um, you know, I wrote my first paper about this idea of like governments competing for citizens back in like 2002, 2003. Um, and like my first version of it was what's called seasteading. It's just that like in the 2000s, it was like, okay, we need a way to start new societies um, to try out new systems of rules and regulations. And countries were not at all willing to like work with us to do that. And so, you know, traditionally, um, the frontier is the place where people go and are able to like create new jurisdictions and all land is taken. 
the oceans the next frontier. So I, you know, I worked on that, like, how can we settle the oceans? And it's really difficult. It's really difficult and expensive to settle the oceans. Um, and, uh, you know, but like the idea of opening a new frontier made a lot of sense. Um, it's a shame we but, didn't see you down here at the Ocean Builders in Panama for their their grand opening a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, uh, I, I, I unfortunately wasn't able to, to make it, but I was, I'm really excited to see their progress. It's pretty neat. I was out there. Um, I'm friends with Grant and with Chad and all of those types of guys. Um, so it would have been neat to see you down here in Panama. They're doing a lot of cool work with those types of things as well. Yeah, I'm looking forward to visiting. So, um, you know, so I'm still on the board of the Seasteading Institute, and uh, and we are buying one of their the uh, these ocean builders pods, and we're gonna like set it up as a C B and B, you know, like an Airbnb. Um, and I'm really excited to put into it. Like, people are always sending me um, like self published like fiction in the world of seasteading, which I really enjoy. Um, and of course, there's all these like beautiful like renderings, like sea setting just fires up the imagination so well. And so I'm really excited to like have like a sea pod where, um, you know, you, you can like kind of like read all of the classic like books about like sea setting and new countries and like see all of like, I mean, there's board games that people have made um, about sea setting, uh, you know, novels that they've written and just like having a place where people can go and stay and you're like living on the water, um, you know, surrounded by kind of like all of this like culture and material about the world of seasteading. So I, you know, I think that's really exciting. Um, but also in, in 2010, uh, the country of Honduras changed its constitution to create the, the world's first program for making, um, well, what, what Paul Romer calls charter cities, but basically like special jurisdictions, um, the evolution of the special economic zone where the zone has significantly different laws and institutions than the rest of the country. Uh, and so I've been working, you know, for the last 10 years or so with countries like Honduras on creating these programs where you can make a city that has kind of its own laws. And it's like one step towards this idea that, that we talked about in the beginning, of like actually going out and someday making new countries. Amazing. Yeah. I've followed the progress in Honduras quite a bit. The government, the direction that they're changing in Honduras is very sad. You know, it's yeah. such a beautiful thing is being built there. And a woman runs on the idea of tearing it down and somehow gets elected. Do you have any um, updates on how things are going there? Are you are you still positive about Honduras or is it going to be more of um, a test run and now we can take these types of ideas to other countries and and carve out areas in there. Um, I, I'm optimistic that um, I'm optimistic that things will work out in Honduras to to mutual benefit. Um, so yeah, my my fund Pernomo Capital is an investor in Honduras Prospera, uh, which is operating in the island of Roatan, and you know they're um, they're building and making jobs for Hondurans, you know, more and more jobs every day. And that's a good thing. And, uh, you know, they're supported by the law. And while the Honduran government has, has chosen to, like, close down the program and not accept any new zones, you know, I, I don't think that's a good decision. But of course, it's their choice. Um, I think that we're going to see over time, like, a, a really big positive impact from the work of uh, of Honduras Prospera um, on the local economy, you know, just growing, growing, growing over time. Well, I can see that because there's a lot of construction. There's a lot of hiring the local population and giving them work and giving back. And from my understanding, you know, there's a real interaction of the locals and of the foreigners and expats who are coming into the community. There's a lot of mutual respect. This is not some colonialist type of thing. This is, you know, trying to work together and build something. So, you know, maybe under the new admin, the, the administration next time, maybe they'll see all of these types of things and actually be hoping that the expats and the foreigners actually want to stay in Honduras because it'll have such a positive effect. I'd like to think that. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone involved shares an interest in Honduras prospering, right? And having like good jobs, 
uh, for Hondurans. And I think that's, you know, hopefully something that everyone involved can connect around. Okay. Now there's uh, several other projects in Honduras. I don't know too many of those ones. Are you involved in them as well? Or really the focus is on Prospera itself? Uh, I'm not involved in the other ones. There are two other Zetas uh, that are there and, you know, continuing to operate that were kind of set up before the program was ended. Mm -hmm. And so the Prospera, the laws right now is that no other areas are going to be able to join it. That's what's been stopped right now. Well, I mean, I'm I'm not the best person to talk about this because I invest in these projects around the world. But yeah, mm -hmm. like like roughly, they set up the program starting in 2010, um, and I actually worked with Honduras back in 2011, 2012. But the program kind of wasn't ready then. It took mm -hmm. them like a number of years to actually be able to launch it. You know, given that it's like the first time in in the world that a country has done something like this, which is really incredible. Um, and you know, kudos to the to the team there that that put this together. Um, yeah. So, what are the projects that you're really excited about these days? What are the ones that you're working on that really keep you up at night and have you, you know, excited and 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 energized to talk about? Yeah. So, um, so, you know, my my job is to invest in what I call these sovereign communities around the world. And uh, I define a sovereign community as a group of people who get together and they see like some part of the tech stack of their life that's like not working. And, you know, and that could be anything from like money as in like Bitcoin um, to like healthcare, education, transportation, like the laws and municipal governance, like any part of that stack. And they say, you know what, we're going to like take this back. We're going to like, we know that there's economies of scale and operating whatever this is, but we kind of like don't like how it's being done. We're going to take it back ourselves, rebuild it at a small scale and like deploy it locally. And so I think of Bitcoin as a sovereign community because they did this for money. Uh, they said like, okay, central banks are using this like money that they're inflating all the time. We don't like that. We want this non dilutable currency. So we're just going to create it. And we're kind of taking back sovereignty over our currency for ourselves. Um, and, uh, you know, a, uh, like a charter city, um, a company that's working with the government to create one of these special jurisdictions is saying, okay, let's take like this kind of like regulatory environment, municipal government, like that's what we're going to take back and we're going to like redesign it ourselves locally. Um, and so that's what we're looking for around the world. It's kind of like groups of people who are just like taking over some part of that stack, but, you know, it can be, it. It could also be something like cul-de-sac, um, America's first car-free neighborhood in, in in Arizona, where they're just saying like, "Hey, we're going to like redesign neighborhoods to use 21st century transportation technology." Um, they're like reclaiming that part of the grid from kind of like the system and saying, "No, no, 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 no!" Like we're going to do this ourselves differently. So I think it's like a really, really fun time right now. I mean, it, it kind of like sucks, like as a as a customer, it sucks that like so many of the systems that our lives run on are like falling apart or not working very well. But like as a builder, like a tinkerer, like an investor, it's a great time because there's like all this stuff that's not working that has to be redone. And so like I think now is a time when the economies of scale and things like governance and education and healthcare and money and all these things like are 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 outweighed by the fact that they're all being done in these kind of legacy ways really poorly. Um, and it's a time when like local groups can, like you can actually like, you know, you could make like a 10,000 person village with your own healthcare system and like probably do better than like uh, a lot of countries do right now. So it's like a really, really fun time when uh, individuals can create communities that are actually do a better job than these like mega countries that we're part of. Amazing. Yeah, I think that's how you and I got connected in the first place. Um, I think it was my business partner, Michael Strong, who introduced us because he does a lot of the education, um, building uh, online communities for schools and alternatives to state run education. And I've partnered with him to do an international version of his domestic school and to kind of take a lot of the ideas mm -hmm. and move them offshore. So as we're, you know, we do real estate projects in Central America and things like this, not 
in Prospera and trying to change all the government, but small communities with homes and trying to pipe in different alternatives like the education or using Bitcoin and other types of cryptocurrencies for these types of things. You know, there's so much to be said for this because as government has a stranglehold on so many different institutions in the world, it really makes it very difficult if you're dependent on them for everything to have any freedom in your life. So one by one, if you can take these back, as you had said, and find alternatives to it, then the possibilities of freedom really start to open up. So that's what we've been really focusing on the program over the last, say, year or so is learning about um, different agricultural techniques, different forms of government, different forms of self-defense. And, you know, I I don't want to say prepping by any means, because that's not really the idea, but it's more of a self-reliant community. Um, And then how do we support each other through this? Yeah, that's beautiful. It's wonderful you're working with Michael Strong. He's one of the, uh, one of the few people out there who was thinking about these ideas, you know, um, like for more than 20 years, like back in the nineties, uh, he was definitely one of my, one of my inspirations. Um, and he was also working very early, uh, with Honduras on, on trying to create these zones. So that that's beautiful, but yeah, it's like, it's like, there's this whole, you know, for tech people that can think of it as like, there's this whole like suite of tools that we live under, right. The education system, the health system, the financial system, like our currency, and there are like parts of that that work pretty well. And there's parts of that that work really poorly. Um, and I'm just like really excited to be working with the people who are like seeing the parts that work poorly and like, no, nope, we're going to redo that. Let's reinvent that. So do you think it's technology that is allowing us to make so much leaps and bounds right now? Or do you think that it's the motivation of people because of what we've seen over the last couple of years of an encroachment on people's freedoms or is it something else because we have seen a a massive shift lately yeah i I have this idea that the um the 21st century began in like march of 2020 um (laughs) like that that for the first 20 years like like technology was kind of changing everything invisibly right but like the legacy system was still hanging on and like pretending that it was still the 20th century like and that was kind of like the cover that was on everything and i feel like covid kind of came and like ripped off that cover and it's like no wait actually like this is the 21st century 21st century is different from the 20th century in some like really significant ways right like cryptocurrency and decentralization and um you know movement to to individual sovereignty and the way that like technology impacts our lives and like all these things and the legacy systems are going to have to like adapt or die because that's just that's like the way of the universe um so yeah it's it it's it's definitely been in the last few years like a huge increase in the number of people who are open to these kinds of ideas who are like wanting to live in in sovereign communities wanting to like design and build their own sovereign communities which has been you know really great for this space that people like like michael strong and i've been working on for 20 years of, of saying like hey we've got to find new ways to live together we have to find new political and economic and social systems and to do that we have to actually be able like we and we don't do that by like sitting around and just like talking about it right and like going to the bar and having a drink and being like oh I hate capitalism or i love capital <laughs> like whatever no it's like it's it's much more like like um you know i think about government like like a an entrepreneur or like an engineer it's like an actual thing that you actually build for actual people and deploy and then like see how it works and like tinker with it and that's what we need we need people starting societies um, that have their own like rules, their own different ways of living and are like trying out some options. Right. And like, those are the test beds and then we'll see which ones work and which ones don't we'll scale. Like more people should move into the communities that are working well, that are making like healthy, vibrant, prosperous people. Um, and you know, that's kind of, to me, what an efficient like governance industry looks like. We've got these huge firms like the United States or Canada, um, that are like, you know, they're really big. They're not going to go away anytime soon. They're very like strong and stable and powerful. They're also doing like a pretty crappy job. They're not innovative at all. Uh, a lot of people are like really dissatisfied. Um, and and you know, and and from you know from kind of like that place, uh, we want to be building like what is the next generation? What are the places that are going to be like the United States was in the 19th century? And it was like, 
hey, we implemented this like radical new political system that like Europeans said said that like we were crazy. Like, uh, you know, this this the like constitutional representative democracy, like it's I don't think it's like the best political system in the world like that can exist. I think we can do like much better, but it was like a huge innovation at the time, right? It was like way better than other political systems. Um, and so it, it, you know, it, it, it triumphed, like the U.S. grew really fast. There was all this economic opportunity, created all this like wealth and value. And like, that was amazing. Um, but now it's the 21st century, right? Like what are the next frontiers? Like what are the next places that are explored like that? Uh, and, and I think it's, it's these, uh, these like charter cities and, um, and network states is something else we can talk about. A network state is uh, a group of people who are organized around a set of shared values online. And then eventually they materialize into physical locations together. Um, you know, things like that, I think, are the are the new frontier. Yeah, because I think that a lot of these legacy programs, as you had said at the beginning there, you know, it's adapt or die. You know, sometimes I go back and forth on on what is going to happen because some of them it just looks like there's just no way for them to adapt. They're just dragging their heels so much on these types of things, and and I have no hope for them. But at the same time, they're fighting so whole so hard to hold on and to control people that I just I just don't know what's going to happen for society because it just looks like a controlled demolition on all mm-hmm. fronts. Um, and it's like, you know, they're going down with the ship and they're going to bring us with them. And, you know, it's going to come to a head or it already has come to a head. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, this is where the power of exit and voting with your feet, voting with your wallet, voting with your passport comes in. Um, and you know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, of exit, uh, to the, to the degree where sometimes like when people want to like attack the idea of like exit. Um, they, they, they attack people like me, um, in, in the media. Me too. Me too. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, but, but just the idea of like, it's yeah. Like if you're in a system that's not working, one thing you can do is try to fix it, uh, and try to exert influence within it. And another thing you can do is to switch to a different system that's working better. And that, that switching is one of the most like powerful forces in the universe for good, right? Like good things come from trying a bunch of different things and then shifting resources from the stuff that's not working into the stuff that's working. Like it's great. And like we, like you and me, like we are among those resources, right? That, that, that can choose to shift. Um, and so I, you know, it's like really clear that the West is in decline, right? You can look at like Ray Dalio has like actually quantified this and gone interviewed all historians and made that made the charts and such. And you can get a, like a lot of mileage out of a declining empire, right? It's not going to like collapse tomorrow, but it's like, it's clearly on the downslope. Um, and that's why I love like working with these kind of like vibrant communities around the world, um, working places like Nigeria, Malawi, Bhutan, uh, Palau, um, like small jurisdictions that are kind of like eager to like try new laws and bring in new people and, and, and try new things. Um, you know, from within the shadow of like a failing empire, you know, where, where I sit here in, in my home in the, in the mountains of the California Bay area, which I think still has like, uh, like one of the highest concentrations of wealth in the world. And I think the highest concentration of interesting people in the world, but, um, you know, is also like the state government doesn't work very well. The national government doesn't work very well. Um, you know, it's kind of like, it's like a failing empire, uh, like this is the base from which I go out to other parts of the world, like more like exciting, innovative parts of the world that are actually like building the future. Well, you know, going to your comparison of the 20th century to the 21st century from our side, I think that the 20th century was really about trying to fix the programs in the States and Canada, you know, talking to your local representation or to your congressman or these types of things. I think that's a really 20th century idea. And I think 21st is more what the what you're working on now, which is, you know what, that's just not going to work exit, build something new, start from fresh. And, you know, there's just no way to, to change the minds of, of these big institutions. And I don't even want to try. Like I just, I have no energy for that. It doesn't excite me. I don't, I've seen people spend their entire lives beating their head against the wall, trying to do this and have gotten nowhere. So I think that, 
you know, the important work that you're doing right now and, and others in this field and people we've mentioned on today's program, you know, I think that, you know, so many people are coming together and are coming to the same conclusion that we need to exit, that we need to start from scratch and, and build something together. Awesome. Yeah. I, I, I I'm, I'm with you, brother. Like, I, I respect those who are like trying to find the levers to affect the existing institutions. You know, there's a lot of people and a lot of value like locked into those institutions and that's a beautiful thing. But at the same time, like, look, I, I, I was at Google for 10 years uh, from like 2004 uh, as a software engineer. I know that like what systems like really need to like to be fixed or to improve is to be rewritten like from a blank slate. And that's just what you have to do. Um, you know, like, like you're saying, and it's really exciting that we live in it and it sucks that we live in a time when like the big old systems are failing. Cause man, it, you know, it would be nice to like work on something else or worry about something else. But like, as it happens, we, we like, we live in a time when what's happening is that like the, these like legacy systems of government and legislation and money and finance are kind of like visibly aging and creaking and failing around us. And like, that's what needs to be rebuilt anew. Like, I don't know. I think that's pretty fun. Um, you know, let's, all right, let's, let's tinker with that. And that's, you know, one reason I love the the, the whole like, like cryptocurrency industry is that these th people are getting to like rebuild the entire like financial system, including primitives like money and like hard money from scratch, which I think is just like, so like fun and, and, and beautiful and needed and like, so very 21st century, right. It's like what we need to get, get away from the, from the 20th century. Yeah. I would agree with that completely. So I'm a big history buff. I have read 1,001 history books over the years and looking at different civilizations, not just, you know, Western civilizations, but because my wife is from China, learning a lot about Asian culture and Asian history and things like that. And you read about these monumental changes that happen in the world. Um, my question to you is, you know, do you think that these changes are happening at an accelerated rate? than, you know, any other time in history, because we have the internet, we have the sharing of ideas, we have programs where, you know, I mean, we're talking to each other virtually, but it's like we're in the exact same room. There's never been this ease of communication. So, you know, what's your opinion on the time frame? Because we are seeing a, a shift right now, for sure. Yeah, uh, it, it it's definitely true that like the increased wealth and increased technology is accelerating the rate of change. Um, and, you know, it's, that means that's destabilizing, right? It's like tough from a security perspective. Um, you know, we all, we all want like security, safety for things to be like predictable and known and understood. And we don't get that these days and that sucks. But at the same time, in terms of the influence that individuals can exert, right? Like our, our power to like patch and fix and update and even like replace parts of the system has never been higher. And so like, it, that's the kind of countervailing aspect to that fact that like, we don't have like long-term safety and security. I mean, like, you know, a thousand years ago, you could probably make a decent prediction about what the future would be like in a hundred years. But like now, like a hundred years is past the horizon of, you know, AI, for example, right? Or like, it like crazy, like nanotech that could like rebuild our entire bodies or like biotech um, that could you know, either make like every human, like super, super like healthy and brilliant or like, just like kill us all. Right. Like, so we live in a time when, because of that, the like leverage of technology and the rate of change, the future is, is really unpredictable. Right. And that's hard, but it also means that we're in a time of like high personal impact. And so I think it's like really important that you know, that good people, which is most people are like thinking about the future and looking at the world and then like taking action to fix parts of it, you know? And I think what you and I share is this understanding that like fixing parts of it is, is not like putting a sign for like, who's going to win the next election, like in your front yard, like, yeah. <laughs> like we actually need to like go and build things at the scale where a small group of people can like really like rebuild and pioneer them, like at the size of um, you know, like a village or, or a city, like the projects that I invest in. Amazing. Yeah. It's, it just seems like everything is so condensed right now, you know, over the last couple of years. And I, and I would foresee the following couple of years to see, you know, what might've taken a decade in another time is taking 12 months now. And I think that, 
you know, within the next couple of years, we won't even recognize the world as it is today. So it's just, it's in such a flex, uh, flex right now, uh, flux. Um, yeah, it's just really fascinating to be, to be working on the front lines and these types of things. Now I, I am curious because you mentioned some of the other countries that you're working in. I know because you have a fund, there's probably some proprietary things or some things that you're not able to share, but I would love to hear about some of the other projects that you're working on in foreign countries or places that we should, you know, start to research or start to keep an eye on, you know, trends that you're seeing. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'd say my, you know, my, my like long-term mission is to help upgrade humanity to 21st century governance um, and, and doing it right now through like creating these like actual existing in real life communities like uh, Honduras Prospera, where they're are getting to like rebuild part of the stack that they live in. Um, some of our other companies that I'm really excited about, uh, there's talent cities in Nigeria. Um, so they're building their first, their first uh, project, which is called Itana. And Nigeria has this like huge population, uh, this huge like tech population. Um, and, you know, as well as like a lot of like cultural impact in Africa through music. And so it's this like really, really important hub um, for, for Africa. And, but the infrastructure, the government, you know, struggles and the infrastructure is, is often not very good. And like a lot of Nigerian tech workers leave the country, you know, whether it's to the US or Canada or other places for jobs. Um, and, and so like creating a campus that has like solid, like solid infrastructure where like these Nigerian tech workers can like be at home like in their home country. And this is this is part of like the the human interest side of these charter cities, right? Is like there's all these people who like have to like leave their countries for economic opportunity to get access to reliable infrastructure or financing. And like that's really sad. I mean like traveling is great if like you want to travel, right? That's amazing. I love to travel. Um but like needing to like leave your home country and your social networks and your family uh for economic opportunity like that kind of sucks. And part of the idea of these communities is that we can um, bring like really solid like infrastructure and regulatory environments to places that don't have them so that people can like work in these charter cities rather than having to leave the country. And so that's what Talent Cities is aiming to do um, in Nigeria um, is create a campus to like repatriate Nigerian tech workers by making a place that's as, as nice to live. Um, you know, both from an infrastructure, like how well does stuff work perspective, as well as the legal environment, how easy is it to do business, to incorporate, et cetera. So that's one that I'm really excited about. And they they actually have um, an e-residency. I, I, I decided just recently, I was like, man, all the projects I work with that are like doing things like these e-residencies, I just, I need to like get, I need to apply myself. Like I want to be in. <laughs> so I've got my like Estonia e-residency passport Um application in because i was just meeting with them this summer yeah, this yeah. talent cities one um prospera you got your prospera e pro, residency uh, yeah I'm, I'm applying for the prospera e residency uh and then in um in palau we're doing some really re really interesting work there um you know so palau is this uh you know small uh archipelago in the in the pacific it's has very strong ties to the u.s um, and they're creating a a digital residency. It's it's essentially um, you can view it partly as as like a way to like demonstrate information to a sovereign that they can then attest to third parties. So for example, you you could like do your digital residency in Palau, go through like KYC AML, and now like anytime you need to open like a wallet like Palau can attest that you've already been KYC AML by them and like other people don't, don't need to, um, you know, that's part of the goal, but it, it could also be like other facts about yourself besides KYC AML. It's sort of like a way to have sovereigns, um, to like have a sovereign, like inspect you basically, and then like verify things about you and then like attest to other sovereigns. The other thing that I'm like super excited about in, in Palau, um, that I'm working on is we're, we're creating a, an offshore corporate registry, the Palau X corporations, uh, working with, with the Palau government and a company called Metropolis on this law. And what these X corporations will let you do is incorporate in offshore in the jurisdiction of Palau 
using whatever body of corporate law you want, like starting with Delaware. So like rather than trying to come up with their own body of corporate law or copy someone else's body of corporate law, if we think from a software perspective, the X corporations, they just import it. They just say whatever the current corporate law of Delaware is, whatever the precedents that have been set in the chancery courts, that's what we'll use. And so when there's a corporate law case, you just use an arbitrator who's familiar with Delaware law, as most of them are, because it's like the most standard jurisdiction. And then they arbitrate according to Delaware law. And so, and and that's the first one. I mean, we're also looking at adding places like Singapore, which mm-hmm. has become really big for like crypto and other incorporations in Southeast Asia, uh, Caymans, Taiwan, things like that. So the idea is um, you could like, you can like port your corporation into this offshore jurisdiction without having to change any of your corporate documents, right? Any of your motions, because you're under exactly the same body of law. It's just like moving like a software server, like like moving like your 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 web server from like one server to another that has the same tech stack. That's wild. So just to be clear, so every corporation there could have a borrowed law from different jurisdictions. So your company there could have a different set of laws than my company has there. Is that what you're saying? Well, in the same way that if you incorporate in the Caymans and I incorporate in Singapore, we have different bodies of corporate law. Yeah, 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 for so sure. So doing that same thing, but within one corporate registry. It's, uh, now, now each each of the bodies of law has to be like individually reviewed and approved by the government of Palau. But so, so you could have like a menu of kind of you know, if exactly. one company's already done it for Delaware, then we already know that. And if another company's already done it for Cyprus and we like that, then those could be two of them. But if it was, I don't know, um, Panamanian, you know, civil law, which is, I mean, where I am right now, and you yeah. decided that that was the law you wanted there, then maybe you could bring it over and you might be the first one. So you would work through it and they would get approved. And then other people could follow in your footsteps using the same type of legal structure. Yeah. And I I say like for me in my career, like two of my most like, like generative metaphors, one of them is I've already talked about is this like governance as an industry, just like think of yourself as a customer, the countries or the firms. The other one is thinking of laws and institutions from the lens of software engineering. And so you can see that like what this is, this law in Palau is doing, it's kind of like modularizing and, and, and like treating like software, because the thing is like all any law that's not a secret is open source. Like law is open source by nature because it's like published. So when you're like going to form an, a new legal system, you can always refer to like anybody else's law. So th- there's this ability to like kind of like copy and remix and import law that we're like not using that much um, that we really could be. I and mean, we see with software development, when you have open source software that lots of people are looking at, different people are trying different versions of it. You have like forking where like somebody takes one body of code and says like, I'm going to change it in this direction while you're changing it in this other direction and we'll see what works better. Um, You know, and, and then sometimes it's like, Oh, like you tried this thing that we thought was crazy, but it actually worked out really well. We're going to bring that back to like the main, the main branch. We're going to incorporate that into like the default version. Like we can do all of that with laws. So this is one of the things that I'm excited is like finally starting to catch on after, you know, like for me, like, like this is something that that Balaji Srinivasan and I have been talking about for like over a decade now. It's like, like laws are like code and that we can use these insights um, in order to make more like flexible modular legal systems. So can you stack these as well? Like cherry pick some of the best laws from this place, the best laws from this place. Cause like some people, mm-hmm. like I work in trusts and foundations and all the time, all the time. So sometimes we like some of those things from the, the trust laws from a common law country, but we want something else from a civil law. So are you able to stack these types of things? Or if you take one, you have to take all the good, bad and ugly that come with it. No, I mean, it's again, it, like laws like software, right? So like you can you can pick and choose, but then there is work that has like because because law hasn't been thought of as software, it hasn't been written to like a consistent API or module structure, right? So it needs to be like restructured and there's work that has to be done. If you take law from different jurisdictions, right? The definitions don't always match up. There is like a bunch of work that has to be done to reconcile, mm-hmm. but it it is possible. And it's, you know, I'll just say, make the bold prediction. Like I think over time, over the next 10 or 20 years, you're going to see like bodies of law changing to be like more modular and have clearer APIs and like more able to be remixed because the bodies of law that do that 
are going to work better. They're going to innovate faster. And then they're going to get copied more because again, because like law is open source. Um, and so we're going to see like a lot more progress and yeah. And just like the, the, this whole world we're in the same way, like, oh, I'm going to build like a tech app. Okay. Like I'm like, what is my stack? What's my database? And what's my web server and all that? Like, and, you know, I'm going to kind of put it together. You might be like, all right, I'm going to start a city. Like what's my trust law? What's my like corporate law? Like what's my zoning codes? Uh, let me like put it together uh, and then customize the parts of it that like, I'm excited to customize. We're like, no, no, my community wants to do this. You know, we want, we want our, our, our laws in this area you know, maybe it's about like banning high fructose corn syrup. It's something I kind of like to see being big done. <laughs> and like along with like trans fats and stuff, like we're gonna do, you know, the laws about like what food products are allowed here, like differently. Um, and then like you customize that. And just having this whole world of like um, you know, different communities, different countries, like are each like testing different variations of like the modules, different combinations of the modules, and just like getting this whole industry kind of operating and innovating at the at more like the speed of tech because it can because like law is by its nature like it's a set of instructions. It is just like computer code, and it's like it's virtual, right? Like in the same way that you can like take a piece of code and be like, hey, run it on these thousand computers, or you can like take a server and be like, okay, we're going to change from this to this, um, like. Are, you can like just you know buy an act of of like a government can say okay we're going to change the laws in this area to be this so it like the the um well in math we'd call it like an isomorphism isomorphism but like basically like the similarity between like law and code it's like not just a superficial metaphor like it's actually pretty deep and i think that humanity can get like as a species we can get a lot of mileage out of like embracing that metaphor and you know kind of getting in and like building so one of the things that palau could do or, or kind of sounds like it is doing reminds me of in <laughs> cryptocurrency with the interoperability where you have two different types of blockchains and then how to make them communicate with one another so with this with different type of legal systems being able to fit them together and have it come in seamlessly i mean this is like stuff I've never thought about before. I actually know more of your work from, you know, the free private cities and charter cities and these types of things, but I've never heard you talk about these things before from the legal side. So this is really amazing. Awesome. Yeah. Glad you're enjoying it. It's, it's, it's really, it's really like the other, the other half of it. Um, you know, it's like the, like startup countries, like, um, you know, that whole like entrepreneurship and business metaphor, but then like the other half is like law is code. Um, and like what Honduras Prospera did, you know, for their body of regulations is they were able to like look around the world at different legal systems and kind of like pick and choose and assemble a combination of them. Um, another project I'm involved with, uh, ULEX, the universal legal system with Tom Bell, um, is trying to create sort of like a, a you can almost think about like a Linux kernel, uh, for law. So just like, um, simplified version of like the best practices uh for law kind of like very very minimal so I'm like not trying to have like the regulations of car emissions or something very very specific like that but like what's what's like the most basic definitions of of people and contracts and and interactions and things like that and it's actually it's open source it's like literally on github uh so i'm really excited about that stuff well, you say that it's open source, but I can also see it being an industry where people would compete to create laws or to simplify things and have things, you know, plug and play where that could be a business in itself. And, you know, we're seeing so many nation states who are are now state run capital, you know, if they could actually make their legal systems the most attractive and then export that to foreign countries and be compensated for that type of legal work. I mean, I think that would be a great thing. Like usually I want to see everything that's open source. I want to see everything that's completely transparent. And, but at the same time, I could see a reason that you want to have intellectual property rights on these types of things. And then you're rewarded for making laws, you know, fair and just and popular and laws that are going to attract the right type of people, wealthy people, entrepreneurial people, people with a good head on their shoulders, you know, whatever mm -hmm. the criteria it is that you are looking for to fill the populace of your country. If you can, you know, style those types of laws, the best popular, then, you know, being rewarded for that work, I think is important. 
Yeah, I mean, and we have models from open source software to like to learn from for like how to reward people for contributing. It's just, I think what I'm saying is that it's like the, I agree that it would be awesome for like a law entrepreneur to be able to like kind of like have intellectual property in laws, but just because the nature of law is that like we humans like hate living under like secret hidden laws. Mm -hmm. And so they're all basically like published. It means they're like kind of all automatically open source. And that means that people in other jurisdictions like can always just copy them and that it kind of is what it is. But fortunately we've got like decades of like the open source movement to show like how you can still compensate people like for, I mean, you know, there's still like, how effectively does the government like implement them and operate them? Like, like how well does it combine and harmonize the different modules? Like how quickly does it like update for new circumstances? Um, you know, I think that you can still get, get really significant reward while just accepting the fact that like, oh, you know, like there's a difference between, um, you know, so, so my dad's a, an, an economist um, of like law and economics. And so there's a difference between like things that are like fully revealed by use and not revealed by use. So like a movie, when you watch a movie, you're like getting to see like, like everything, the entire output product. And so there's kind of like no way to stop someone from pirating that because they can always like record the entire out output product. Um, but when you play a, an MMORPG, right, like a multiplayer role-playing game, like you're just going to like this region or that region and interacting with the server in this way is like, you're not getting the entire thing in your experience. And so the company can like, you know, or, or when you're using Google, right, you go and do a Google search, like you're getting the results, but you're not getting the code that generated those results. And so for those things, they can actually like be kept secret. And I think that like laws are, you know, of that like first type where they're like fully revealed. And so we just kind of like need to accept that and use those mechanisms but like all of the rest of like the process of setting up a jurisdiction and establishing courts and making sure that they're like fair and efficient like all of that like can be the secret sauce for a company well to use a very super super simple example i think about um websites in terms of conditions and disclaimer policies and privacy policies and cookie policies and all of these types of things. I own probably about 20 websites right now, and every one of them has to have slightly different ones. So I'm very happy to pay a third party company. And it's kind of like a, a McDonald's menu. You know, I want this, 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 and this, and they put it all together and you just fill in your information. And I'll at the end comes out all the legal work for all of these types of policies that I have to have. Um, and every website is slightly different because, you know, the purpose of the website is slightly different and what is, you know, how it all fits together is slightly different. So you could see uh, systems or companies or businesses that would have a similar type of um function or working, but in a much more complex manner, you know, instead of it taking you, you know, a few minutes to go through, it could be, you know, months or something like that, but still the same type of flexibility and modular, as you had said before. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Um, okay. So to circle back, cause we have gone on a little bit of a tangent on the laws, which I love, which I think is, is yeah. so brilliant and it's is a really new out. thing. Yeah, exactly. So I, my mind's already shifting, you know, gear, my gears are going like, well, what about this? What if we did that? What if we put this together? Um, so how does this fit into your fund? Because I mean, we've talked about two related things, but kind of different things, but I want to understand how it all fits together in your fund. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the way it works is that I think of these sovereign communities as kind of like creating GDP, like just creating like economic activity and value. And then they capture a share of that GDP, generally with some combination of taxes and like rents. Um, and, you know, I, as a libertarian, I used to be like really against taxes, but when I shift to this viewpoint of like, you're a consumer of a product and like, there's some price that you pay in order to get governance services, um, it, it kind of like makes sense to me. And also the idea that like, uh, if you want to incent the city owner to be like maximizing the value that people create, giving them like an equity share in that value makes sense. Like from the Silicon Valley startup world and like, what is taxes? Like, it's like if the city gets seven and a half percent and that's not a random number, seven and a half percent is like the lowest that you can, that you can do and not be counted as like a tax haven. Um, and so you still get like full access to the global financial systems. Um, you know, so 
you can charge seven and a half percent. And it's like, if you, if the city owner is able to like bring in more people who are creating value or adjust the laws to create more, more value or just the infrastructure so that people are like making more value, they then have like an equity share of that. And if they're able to create a ton of value, then they make like a ton of money. Um, and so like those are the main mechanisms. So you're, you're creating value by getting a group of people to come and live together in a community to like redo some of the systems they live under to do them better and then to like grow and thrive and bring in like lots of other people and like scale up, you know, from a village to a town, to a small city, to a big city. Um, and then our fund invests, you know, generally pretty early, like pre-seed or seed series A is about the latest right now. Um, when these communities are kind of like negotiating with governments um, like finding the people who are, who are going to live there and bringing them together, like before they have the big, like land and infrastructure costs, we invest. And then we have a share in the operating company that's then like operating this real estate, uh, and, you know, like taxes and, um, taxes and rents is, you know, they're two of the biggest expenses for a lot of people. So like, that's like plenty a slice of GDP to capture. And I just, I just love the incentive alignment. Um, that like the more value you create in the zone, uh, you know, like the, the more revenue the company has. And so as a fund, we invest in these operating entities that are creating these communities. Um, and we're just seeing like such growth around the world and like more and more of these being started. Um, and some of the ones that we funded, like growing, uh, like Honduras Prospera is, is building like the largest uh, towers on the island of Roatan right now, the Duna residences, where each of the four towers would individually be like the highest uh, structure on the entire island. Um, and so there's a lot of really exciting growth. Um, and so we're um, like working on new investment vehicles to be able to invest later stage uh, in this real estate. And kind of like, you know, like when we're the first investors in a project, we get to know them really well. We get to see like which ones are doing well and and be able to choose follow on investments wisely. And so we're expanding our AUM right now. Um, and yeah, just excited to like help these invest in more of these projects and and help them grow. Uh, our, at our website, pronomos.vc, you can find our angel list, our Twitter, um, and uh, there's a contact form for people who are interested in in learning more about the investment opportunities or in starting these communities themselves. Um, you know, we're always looking for interested investors and founders. Uh, you know, it's just kind of the nature of the world that, that those are often the shortage. We're in this incredible position where, you know, just like five years ago, um, there was only Honduras. Uh, and the CSA Institute was trying to work with French Polynesia. Um, but now we actually have like a bunch of countries around the world, like, like literally like we're, we need to hire someone. Like once we, um, once we raise a bit more AUM, like we need to hire someone to be like full-time government relations partnership. Cause we have more governments interested in working with us than we have like time to work with, um, or than we have like great founders to put on them. Um, and so like, it's so, such an exciting like opportunity that like, that's not, that's not the barrier anymore. Like the world being open to this, we just need to get capital. We need to get great people and slot them into projects. Um, we're shifting into a little bit, you, you know, you asked me earlier what I'm excited about. Uh, we're shifting to a little bit more of like a studio mode. Um, you know, we've always, we've always been pretty hands-on because this is a totally brand new industry. Like nobody's ever done this before. Like we're all inventing it together. Um, and we're seeing like a few opportunities uh, around the world, especially in in uh, West Africa right now, that are so good that I that we're gonna as a fund gonna kind of get hands on. Um, we're working with a couple governments directly uh, to set up projects and set up founding teams ourselves. So incubating, you can think about a little bit like Y Combinator, um, just because there's there's just some like really exciting opportunities, and we we want to make sure they get they get built and, uh, and get built well. So yeah, that's, that, that's kind of how it works. Well, amazing because, you know, I've seen that this is the trend. I mean, I've been following these types of things 
for several years now. But really, over the last year or two, I really see this as one of the biggest trends in the 21st century. You know, this idea of governance and how people organize themselves is just such a massive topic. And I'm so surprised that it's not being talked about literally everywhere. Like, it's just, it's still on the fringe, but I just see it as one of the the biggest trends going forwards. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's so, it's so fun seeing it become real. So this, you know, I've been working on, uh, working on an, an investment deck, uh, for our next raise. And like, this is the first time I've been working on this stuff for 20 years and I'm actually able to put real life pictures of <laughs> real life projects in the real world that have been built and are growing fast into like my materials. Right. It took like, 21 years to get to being able to do that but i'm but i'm there now and it's like so fun to be to, to be able to like go out i'm gonna be able to go out and raise like hey this is actual stuff that's built and working and scaling and we want to invest in growing it that's amazing patrick i love today's conversation super fascinating you gave the website once before but once again if people want to get a hold of you if they want to learn more about your work where can we send them it's pronomos.vc pro n o m o s dot v c um i'd say twitter uh angel list for investors uh there's also like facebook and linkedin uh the word uh, nomos was the ancient greek word for custom but then it became the word for law because they understood that like laws kind of were bottom up they were like enshrined like a custom that was practiced for a long period of time okay let's make that a law um and it survives today in the word like numismatics, which is like collecting old money, because their word for money, nomisma, was based on the word for custom, because they said money is only accepted by custom. It only like is worth something if people choose to accept it. So they're pretty wise 2,000 years ago. So um, pro, pro, of course, means good towards. So pronomos, meaning like towards good law. Amazing. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And I will talk to you soon. Wonderful.